ask Sergio. We're, dude. All right, so welcome to another session of the governance education session. Um, today we are joined by Commodore, who is at Krauss-Hess's governance department, um, and is basically just gonna talk about the knowledge um, gained through this whole process of governance at Krauss House. Welcome, Commodore. Hello, thanks for having me. I, I, well, I don't think we have a department of governance, but I, I appreciate the spirit of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's me on the fly trying to do an interview. Yes. No, no, <laughs> so. I'm sorry to put you. Uh, yeah, I would say, you know, I, I would call myself a Dow governance nerd. Uh, certainly, uh, there's probably one or two other members at Krauss House that likes to think about governance. Um, but uh, I started a podcast when I got in the crypto space around Dow governance and then uh, met a bunch of amazing governance folks that had been building a bunch of cool things, was able to ask a lot of dumb questions. Um, the podcast discontinued, but it's still out there. Some really good episodes. Uh, I think it's armada.fm. Um, it's a great podcast. I'll try to find a link and uh, we can post it. But um, And then I helped Colony for six months or so. Uh, just kind of a core member and really got to meet their team and understand how they thought about governance, which I think is probably the most sophisticated thinking in the space. And then uh, left to go work on Krauss House full time, which has taught me a lot of, you know, in in real life and in a social setting as well, which I also think has different needs than like a DeFi protocol or a protocol uh, generally. So I uh, have learned a lot of like, you know, trial by fire a bit in the, in the DAO ecosystem now. Um, what I was thinking about doing is like, I guess touching on a little bit of the journey at Krauss House and kind of how we got to Governance 2.0. Uh, I think that might also tell a little bit of the story of Colony along the way. And then if folks have questions or you know comments, I'm happy to kind of dive into those, but uh, I'll kind of go in there. It would be helpful context, like what is the, what is the kind of the typical person listening to this? What's their kind of background, interest, space? Like kind of, what's the audience kind of look like? Yeah, so a lot of us are actually already DAO governance operators. Okay, cool. Um, and so what this is, is basically kind of like a meeting of colleagues um, so that we can like kind of like learn of the different models um, and yeah, learnings that we've had so that we could build better governance. So um, cool. that and also like Web3 native DAO Great. operators in general as well. Cool. Great. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's the best kind of audience to get asked for. Um, cool. So I'll keep it pretty you know, you know technical and just you know dive into our own experiences, and then I'm happy to uh, you know dive into edge cases and and whatnot and some of the other stuff. Um, so I think like it's worth noting that uh, Krauss House is on a mission to buy an NBA team, which is I think one of the more ambitious and in real life missions of all the DAOs kind of out there. Um, because of that, we have this objective output, right? Which is to say, like, there's there's a moment in time in the future which we'll be able to check a box, yes or no, to cross us by an NBA team. And what's interesting about that is there's also this entity, which is the NBA, which we have to basically get them to say yes to whatever this this purchase is, right? So this is not like buying land, like City Dow or Cabin Dow, right? Where they're trying to like you know interface with these mechanisms between the DAO and then some sort of legal contract and then and then the nation state and then purchase that land. Uh, we have a group of people, uh, thirty NBA owners, who have to approve this purchase because it's it's really like a it's a club, you know, it's a sort of sports club for lack of a better word, um, and that they have sole discretion on how they want to run it. And so the purpose, I think, from day one is fundamentally different than a lot of the DeFi protocols and these other governance kind of worlds, because we have to conform to some sort of weird and ambiguous social consensus, like, right? So the NBA owners can say, no, we don't like you because of, your, of the name. Uh, they can say, we don't like it because of the logo. I mean, they, all the way down to legal and money and like everything else. So that sets, I think, a really important distinction that we should, you know, I just want to make sure that there's a bias clearly under, you know, understood in, in my talk or this kind of conversation is that because we have to play into a moving target, I think our governance broadly and our governance strategy is far more pragmatic and far more, you know, less idealistic to say like, look, we kind of have to shoot against a moving target anyway. We're not going to restrict our governance flows to be, you know, this very strict, like this is the one thing that we can kind of shoot through 
we have to have a little bit of a dynamic system in order to deliver a relatively dynamic solution. So it's just worth noting um, because I spent a lot of time talking to the colony uh, folks, and I think that they're some of the sharpest governance minds out there, but they have a very idealistic, very um, uh, you know, Web3 ethos driven ideology about what governance is and isn't and what it should and shouldn't be. And I think Kraushaus and sort of our mission was always very, I think, orthogonal and almost a, uh, almost, I think, funny to them a little bit in the sense of just like, 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 I remember they used to tease me before we had fully gone on chain, like, you guys are in a DAO, you're Discord. And I'm like, yeah, okay, absolutely. That's a fact. Uh, I would say that we're a digital native community with a DAO ethos pre chain. Um, but that doesn't like stop us from organizing to do our mission, um, which to me is the spirit of the the word DAO as opposed to maybe the, the on chainness of it. No, that was before. Uh, now, now we are. So, I think it's just a helpful context. Um, some of the things that have really inspired me in the space between the podcast and working at Colony. Uh, Colony had this idea around lazy consensus, which I think is a super powerful concept. If you guys haven't dug into Colony, I think everyone should. You don't necessarily need to use it or anything like that. But I think understanding their kind of their white paper as well as their roadmap is, is probably one of the, the sharpest around. Um, I love this idea of lazy consensus, which is empowering folks to you know, make actions and then assuming everything's in a pass with it, assuming it passes like a reputation bar and a monetary and a time bar uh, uh, you know, criteria. And if it does that, then that action is going to occur unless someone disputes it. And if someone disputes it, that's when you kick off governance. And like, I think it's a very, very sophisticated view of how to think about governance. So that was one big uh, inspiration. Other one is Yearn, uh, Trichiopteryx is Yearn 2.0 white paper, or not white paper, but it is proposal, is Yearn improvement. Um, proposal just walking through this idea of like roles and 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 permissions and then giving the wifey holders direct power to create teams add teams change teams and then create destroy and modify powers as well uh and what he called governance 2.0 uh, i think is another just amazing framework and a mental model that Krauss is, is heavily relied upon to say hey how do we want to model it that in the same in the same way so those are probably the two most like inspirational governance things that um, I've bumped into that we have tried our best to, to emulate. Um, I'll touch a little bit about Kraushaus's governance journey for everyone, um, but we started out and we did it really, really simple. We were looking at, you know, Dow House and, and Snapshot and Colony and Aragon and, and all the other platforms out there and really just felt like we wanted the most flexible governance process, which for us was snapshot. Um, so we put the put the, the treasury in, in a notion safe, put a snapshot on top of it. We didn't use uh, the rea reality module or safe snap or whatever they used to call it. Um, we kind of every kind of executed everything delegated uh, between a transaction team and then sort of the, the steward team. And I think one of the things that we got some love for that I think did work pretty well for Krauss is we established what we call the stewardship team. And the stewardship team's job was you could almost think about it as like a like a validator um, in terms of you know the kind of more of a technical term. It's like here's an idea, and then that idea needs to be morphed into a proposal, and then that proposal needs to be well structured, right? That that it needs to have a scope, a time frame, you know, objective results, things like that, in order for us to say this thing was met or not met, and then you need to go execute that thing. And so what I think is really cool about the stewardship team is a team of about seven people. Um, and the idea was like, okay, so if you go there and, and, and you do that, it's like someone has an idea. They want to do a basketball event at NFT NYC. It's like, okay, well, that's a great idea. It almost reminds me a little bit of like lobbyists interfacing with a, maybe like a senator that's going to help sponsor their bill. It's like, okay, the lobbyist says, we want to make this change. Uh, the senator and their team would say like, okay, well, like here's actually how we're going to go write that into an actual bill that could get voted upon in Congress. It's a similar concept, I think, with the stewardship team is to say, okay, here's your idea. You want to do a basketball event at NFT NYC. Okay, like, you know, where do you want the money sent? How much money? Uh, what are you going to do with the money? Like, what, what's the legal entity? What's the arrangement? Are you selling NFTs as an example? What's the, what's the cut back to the DAO if that's the case? Like, um, you know, how are you going to pay the people that are going to help you, right? Like, you're kind of going through this whole um, scoping to make sure it's like a valid object to say, this is a discrete valid proposal stewardship team's role is to not have a opinion from a validator perspective on whether or not the proposal is a good or bad idea 
barring, um, you know, maybe like a fraudulent proposal, like, hey, I'm going to drain the bank account and, you know, buy a house in, in Puerto Rico, like a, that, that would be an invalid proposal as an example. But um, the goal is to just, this is a valid proposal or not. And then each steward, of course, is free to comment as a, as a voter on the validity of the, of the proposal. Um, and that takes, I think, of some social engineering to make sure people are communicating in the right way. That was one thing that we learned kind of the hard way is that we had a couple of proposals get kind of stuck in like limbo where they would come to our town hall, they'd kind of present their idea, they'd get a bunch of feedback. Some of it was technical, for lack of a better word, this valid, this proposal is invalid. And some of it was like, hey, as a voter, I think this is not a great idea because of X, Y, and Z. And so it does take some sort of very intentional, I think, social norms of saying like, hey, as a steward, I'm get, I'm, this proposal is valid. Like I will you know, give you the green or red light on whether or not this is, meets a valid proposal or something. As a voter, I think this idea is terrible, right? So valid proposal is valid, terrible idea is terrible as a voter, right? And, and being able to communicate with those two different roles in mind is, was sort of a, a prerequisite for us to, to do well with it. And I would say we didn't necessarily do well with it in the beginning, but I think we've gotten a lot better with it. So you take an idea, get into a proposal about stewardship team, make, you know, deems it valid or not, goes up on a snapshot, it's voted upon, assuming it passes, then it's executed by the transaction team. That was kind of governance 1.0 at Crosshouse. And I think that served us quite well uh, in the early days when the decision-making was relatively, you know, while we made a lot of decisions, the decisions were relatively, the values were aligned. I think the vibes were aligned. The excitement was aligned. Community was aligned. Um, it was a new community, new voting, right? So there was just a lot of good vibes to kind of go do that. Over time, you know, you watch voter participation kind of uh, deteriorate, which I kind of, I don't know if it's a hot take, but uh, I don't think that's really a bad metric. I just think it's a it's a metric that's reflective on the um, the broadness of your, of your proposals uh, for what it's worth. But uh, we can talk about that later. Um, and then you just sort of see like the people who kind of care and, and, and who are plugged into it or maybe de want to delegate their 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 decision making. That's where kind of all that action starts to, to kind of land. So we ran that model for uh, roughly a year and then we switched to a governance 2.0 model. And it's very inspired by the urine model, which was just really taking this idea of explicitly giving token holders the power to create roles, destroy roles, transfer roles, and then add and remove members from teams, right? So again, you're kind of thinking about permissions and people as being and giving that kind of surgical power to the community. But once you're kind of in a delegate group, then you're allowed to go do that. So let me give a brief example. You might have a, a media team, right? And the media team might say, hey, we want to publish to the Twitter account. Well, in this world, you can create a team, which would be the media team. You would then grant the media team the Twitter the login, which I think is another fun, fascinating conversation is how most of these web, some of the most high leverage things in web three are actually web two things, right? So who has the Twitter login? Twitter doesn't have a nice, easy, you know, NFT permissioned process to give the main Twitter account posting ability. You got to send them a, a username and password or use tweet deck and maybe create, you know, some, some members and whatnot, but it's, it's, it's still, it's still a mess. There's still an admin, there's still centralization. There's still someone that has the ultimate password. That's not a community owned asset, even though it's one of the most high leverage one well, discords, your DNS records, right? Uh, who owns, you know, who owns and operates the DNS records for crosshouse.club um, or board eight, right? It's like, it, it, those are some of the most high leverage things that you could uh, control. And they're all centralized, um, which I think is under uh, discussed problem in our space. Um, so going back to my example, you have the media team, you say, hey, you have publishing abilities, right? And so you might have a person who kind of goes rogue. Well, you need a mechanism to remove that person from the media team or to remove the published Twitter permission from the media team. And the nice thing is that the media team itself can self-regulate or the broader token holders can say, hey, we need to remove that proposal or remove that person or sorry, sorry, remove that person or remove that um, that permission. And so what I just love about that is that you have a blend of delegated power to this media team, uh, as well as the token holders have acute to sort of surgical power to go in there to make the changes that they might deem appropriate. So I just love that kind of balance between those two things, um, you know, to be able to, to, to just give a, a more robust governance structure. 
So that's kind of where Krausehouse is at now. So we have this, so it's still snapshot related. Uh, you know, we, uh, one th innovative thing you guys might appreciate, which uh, I'm love happy to talk to down nerds, but I think we're doing something pretty cool, which is that the ENS record uh, points to a GitHub repo that has commits that are our active governance state of like, you can almost think about it's like wallets payable and permissions and people. So we have a GitHub repo here. I can actually throw it in the chat. Um, we're looking at switching over to Radical. I think there's some pros and cons to doing it or not doing that, but let me see. Let me show you guys this. You guys might find this interesting. So that is a link to the Krausehouse kind of governance state. And then the idea is that our ENS, which is Krausehouse.eth, points as in a custom attribute. So you can take the ENS record and you can add custom attributes onto it, uh, points to a commit that is sort of the correct governance state. And so what I love about that is that you can have a, a chain of, of authority, right? You say like, okay, we collectively own the ETH record uh, or the ENS record that's owned by the Gnosis safe. Inside there, there's a transaction that's being executed by the, the transaction team that is updating a, a relatively manual governance process to say, this is our governance state. And the governance state's gonna say like, this person who has this role and they're owed this much money, assuming that they do this type of work, right? Uh, this person has Twitter access, this person has domain access, whatever it may be. And so it's just a nice like authority line to be able to say like, these types of actions are valid because of this lineage of authority. Um, and so to me, I think this is kind of probably the you know, I think there's a lot of governance folks out there like, hey, like if you're doing anything on snapshots and it's not using reality, reality module and stuff, it's like, it's not true decentralized governance. I hear that, I agree with that, especially for things like DeFi protocols. Uh, but I think for things that are social, cultural, a lot of humans involved, uh, I think I disagree. I think this is probably the, the lowest valid structure you can do, which is like, at least you have lines of accountability and lines of authority through the entire system to say that these are, you know, uh, valid and so then if you have an issue then you can fork and you can you, know, you can battle over it and figure it out from there but now you have like this kind of you know from mo all intents and purposes github is immutable obviously a github engineer could go in there and, and, and cause some trouble um but um it's about as immutable as it's going to get at the moment i think switching this out to radical and doing that all in chain is probably the final solution in, in this kind of uh adventure but i think it's a pretty cool little mechanism i'd love to see more DAOs uh play with and it's not that hard. Um, you just sign a new transaction that points to an updated uh, GitHub repo commit. So I've talked a lot. I've said a bunch of different things. I just want to take a little break there. Is there any questions or even like directions that folks want to, to kind of take this conversation in? Um, what? Was there any sort of, from Web 1.0 to where it is right now, did like something happen in order for you to realize that like there was a problem? Like maybe there was a contested proposal or maybe there were grumblings in the discord. Like what was that kind of thing that showed a little bit of the cracks that ended up being like, okay, we need to fix things or just That's change it. things. Yeah, I think for us, it was a, we knew that it was a temporary solution. Like we did the NFT sale, we had a bunch in the treasury and it was like, hey, we just need to like, we need to try to buy an NBA team now. Like, like we need to just prop up the simplest governance system that we can roll with and, and go. Um, I also think there was a lot of our project specifically, you know, there's just a lot of people who are like, hey, you know, I want Commodore and Flex to like go as meet with as many NBA owners as possible starting tomorrow, right? And it's like, okay, like that's like a, uh, you know, that's a, less complicated thing to kind of get executing on immediately than than the other paths um so i think one was just it was time to upgrade we've always been feeling that pressure since the day one um and as for i rolly as Krausehouse can be being you know kind of the sports dow uh you know with this crazy ambitious mission that may or may not ever happen and for the record i do think Krausehouse will be an nba minority owner uh in the next year or two uh, i'm pretty confident on that majority owner it might take 10 to 20 years, so uh, don't hold your breath on that one. Um, but uh, I do think there's a path. There is a path for the majority ownership, and there's certainly high probability of the um, minority one. Um, and the hint there is through private equity that has 
native integrations with with Web3, which I think is actually an insane innovation that I'm excited to talk more about in the future. But um, and then I would say then the next thing that happened is that, you know, it was like everything we wanted to go and do because of how flexible the system was in order to make an edit or change that whole process, you basically had to go back with another proposal, right? And so I think that complexity just started to pile up to say, okay, you have a team of five people that are a media team and this is going on, that's going on. Uh, and then now um, a new team pops up. So then we have to have a new proposal get brought up for this. And then we have to maybe make a third proposal, which maybe winds down the first proposal, right? It's like, or the second proposal has to ha capture all the complexity of the first team, right? So it's like proposal number two of team number two would just say, hey, we're going to wind down team one, change who's in it. Here's how we're going to get paid. And here's what we're going to go do. Like stuff like that just starts to pile up. And so we would just have these kind of gaps in, in the governance and the pay structure and whatever to be like, we just had to solve everything with another proposal every time. And so it was feeling just very much um, too complicated. And I think the other thing that I noticed is that with our, we, we've had something like 120 maybe snapshot proposals in roughly a year. So a fair amount per month. Um, but like in every day, every proposal that goes on, then you have like kind of this governance complexity fatigue, right? Which is like, okay, I know that like, here's a, here's a dumb one is that stewards have a, a one of the earliest proposals that stewards have like a $1,000, I think a month or a quarter or something like that discretionary spend on like software and like business travel and whatever it is, right? It's just sort of like some sort of petty cash type type bucket, like a traditional company would have to sign up for MailChimp or, you know, uh, you know, um, whatever it may be, right? It's like, not many people were there when that was enacted. And then in an order, let's just say there was a new proposal that said, hey, we're going to do a proposal that says uh, that number should be 1500. So you're bumping it up by 50%. It's like, well, like now there's like this complexity of like, well, there's, it's already actually an existing permission, which is they have a thousand. And so now like in order to be well-informed, you have to know there was an old one, which is an update to the old one, which is this new one. So it's actually a Delta of $500, not 1500, not going from zero. It's not a new permission. It's you're changing a setting on an existing permission. You know? So it's just like, that's a stupid example. It's probably a bad one, but it's just an example of like how a simple dumb little thing like that all of a sudden has all this like governance, um, context that every voter is supposed to maintain for every single vote and like this team members you know, working on this team part-time and that like so every snapshot i feel like and this is why i love this github model is like if you think about it, is every snapshot is instead of this being like this independent permission that's sort of like collected in the ether um, which is of course a great reason for a governance platform um it's actually an update to our governance state and so that's what we're rolling through, right? Saying like, okay, so we're going to remove this member, add that member and change their setting. Well, now you can actually look at a diff on a GitHub commit and be like, oh yeah, like there's three lines of code, like not code, but text that were modified. That's what this whole proposal effectively is. That's it. All, all the words are context to just these three things, which is, you know, a changing a wallet address, removing one and, and you're changing an NFT permission or something like that. And so I just, I love this idea of like thinking about snapshots and any of these proposals as updates to effectively a governance code base. And what I love about well, the way we're doing it as compared to DAO governance platforms out there is that by definition, we're, we're extendable and modifiable and configurable. You can do whatever you want because it's, it's mostly just conceptual, um, which again has risk. And like, I don't want to say there's no risk. I think some of the you know governance, you know, I, I suspect many of you are like, Hey, there's big central who has the admin keys of the GitHub repo, totally valid concern. How do we, how do we trust like a lot of valid concerns, but I think the concept is super interesting. And I, of course, I think hopefully it's all of us are smart enough to say, oh yeah, I could imagine, you know, switching this to radical having, you know, a, a multi-sig or something signing these, these, these things, like there's a world here where we're just updating this sort of governance state. Um, and you allow the DAOs to be very flexible in how they're going doing it, but they have a single source of truth. Uh, I suspect for the, at least for social DAOs, um, that would work for 80% of them and, and significantly reduce overhead and complexity and probably keep governance high, like participation high and clarity high and all that stuff. So I think it was just kind of another, you know, and yet another proposal of like, damn it, like 
you know, there's like three cross dependents. You have to re remember this, that, and the other thing. It's like, yeah, let's just update it. It's time. Any other questions? Um, so Andrea asked, oh, do you want to actually say it out loud if, if you're yeah. comfortable so I don't have to read it? Okay, great. Um, so I, I love this. I loved your, your tweet thread. Um, I'm curious, thinking about the future of when you're actually like when Krausehouse owns, owns minority or majority a, a, a team, what are the kinds of decisions that owners have to deal with today? And yeah. how much of are you trying to align your current governance model to what you what kind of decisions you're going to have to deal with in the future? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so it's worth noting that like so a minority owner in the NBA. So so we just I, I met with a, a team two weekends ago, and I was talking to the owner, and uh, he, he's excited about the idea. He doesn't want to do it for his team. Spoiler alert on that one. But he was like, hey, I want this few voices in in this in my in my you know cap table than 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 anything. Uh, but he said something really interesting. He said he was talking to another owner. So before he came a majority owner, he wanted to become a minority owner. And he met the owner and he said, hey, I want to buy 10% of the team, um, which at that time was something like $200 million. So this guy's going to write a $200 million check. And he's like, ah, what do I get for my $200 million? And the guy's like, nothing. Uh, you get a piece of paper that says that you own $200 million you know, worth of, of my team. And he goes, can I come to practice? No. Can I, you know, do I courtside seats? No. Uh, can I go into the war room during the draft? No. Um, can I meet the players? Like, I mean, if you want to text them or something like that and they can, they're willing to see you, sure, maybe, but like, no. Uh, and he was like, so I get like nothing. And he's like, yeah, you get nothing. You get a piece of paper that says you own a piece of my team. Like, that's what you get. And, and he made a point that, um, he has a celebrity on his cap table and he was telling me about, it. he was like, Hey, I brought the celebrity around. And he was like, you you own, you know, he owns 1% of the team. He's like, I, I, you can fire a concession worker if you want. Like, like I want you to be a full on owner. If you see something inappropriate or you want to come to the practice or like, like you want to go to the locker, like do whatever you want. You own this building, you own this parking lot, like you own, you, you own it just like me. So first and foremost, you know, like, you know, when we kind of think of on chain or off chain type like you know it, it obviously matters to the person who owns 51 percent. like they call all of the shots um and so and until you're in a ma majority position of owning the 51 percent, yeah you effectively have zero power um for us what we're looking to do is partner with uh, a majority owner who sees the value in having a broad community being involved in this who's willing to delegate key functionality to us that might start out really simply, um, you know, general management, like, as you alluded, that's where everyone's head tends to go. It's certainly where the passion of the fan is, but, uh, the Los Angeles Lakers as an example, uh, obviously performing terribly this season, but, um, they have one analytics person on their, on their staff. Right. And it's like, okay, if you had a collective of 10,000 people who, and then like our, our case, Krause house, like we have, you know, five ish PhD level, um, analytics people, they're like, can we give them a path to contribute to this team at a, at a professional level that would help the, your single analyst uh, do better modeling and predict you know, analytics on the team? And then you, know, you see a front office go, yeah, actually that's kind of nice. And wait, they're gonna pay for the opportunity to work with the guy that I pay to contribute, right? Like the model starts to go from a cost center to a profit center if, if you can filter for high talent. Uh, scouting is another one. They, these teams, you know, these pay these scouts to fly around the world and you know watch these teams or, or have relationships with local people, whatever it may be. And what does a decentralized scouting network look like, right? You go from a, having three scouts maybe that are flying all around the country trying to meet players and watch, and now you tap into ten thousand scouts that go through some sort of training that the team runs just just to be a part of this. Okay, hey, you get free tickets to a game. Go watch this, film this, write down these notes, and send it back to us. Like uh, that's really interesting, right? Now again, another cost center turned into maybe a mitigated cost center um, or potentially a unique, you know, unique value proposition for that team against uh, the other teams. So there's low hanging fruit areas like scouting analytics that I think are areas that we can help teams immediately. I think things like general management, um, we've talked to this general manager with the owner and the general manager is like, hey man, like I don't really want 10,000 people yelling at me for making good or bad decisions. And I, like, I don't know if I can even handle talking to a hundred of them, right? And I kind of jokingly said, I was like, I mean, ESPN and Twitter and you know Instagram, they're, they're already doing that. Like you're already having 20,000 people telling you you're doing your job terribly. Um, what I see this is like, how do we build games, apps, and experiences 
to find out who has talent in the community and the ways that you guys value talent, right? You guys might value someone who's got a night, you know, natural eye for watching. Someone other organization might really be just analytics. They just like high and you know, like we got a Krista quant approach. You guys tell us what you guys value. Let's go, us let go let us go build apps, games, and experiences to find people who are great at that. And then let's elevate three of those people to meet with you for lunch once a month, right? That and then so you now have built a system of of rewards that you feel comfortable with, and then then we build that into an experience for the community to say, okay, if you're able to, I'll make a dumb example, take NBA 2K, and you, there's like a sim mode where you can you can kind of general manage a team, right? Whoever does the best on that, this is a terrible example, but you do whoever does the best on that, you know, for ten digital seasons in a row, those top three people get to meet the GM, right, and and, and work with him on that thing. That's just a really simple, dumb example of like how you take 10,000 people and find three people that are have all have a path to be able to have a voice to the general management of the favorite team um, while not overwhelming the general, general management. So I think it's very meritocratic is, is a big part of how we pitch it. Okay, awesome. Interesting. Thank you. Ali? Hello. You had a question. Yeah. Uh, so sorry, I'm 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 actually not part of this committee. I just heard about this interesting talk, and I wanted to come and ask you a few questions because the community we... is open, actually. So you're welcome. <laughs> Amazing. So because uh, some friends and I were writing a white paper about similar topic, and somebody told me, "Ah, you should check out this talk. They're buying an NBA team and decentralizing and making it as a DAO." So my, my question is about when it comes to the, the token for, for the community, what does the token entitle the community to do? I mean, yes, they're going to vote using the token. But are we talking about decentralized ownership or it's more about decentralized governance without any kind of entitlement to ownership? Yeah, good question. Um, well, we, we did an experiment when we launched everything, which was NFTs for access, tokens for governance. So, you know, the NFT is sort of what gets you into the social experience, and then the tokens are for governance of what we do with the treasury. Um, as it relates to raw equity positions, I like to use this uh, analogy. I'm still working on it, so I will, so bear with me. But um, I think about Krausthaus as like a carnival, right? And it's like, okay, so what is a carnival, right? It's like, well, it's this space, has a fence around it typically, uh, and we need a ticket to get into that world. So that's the NFT. It's like, that's my ticket to walk into the carnival. Now I'm in the carnival. What's inside of a carnival? Well, there's like, you know, games, like, you know, ring toss or something like that. There may be a roller coaster. It's probably not super safe to go on. That's why I don't love my carnival analogy, but it's a roller coaster. Maybe there's food concessions, right? Uh, maybe those are the three categories of the types of things that are, that are there. Um, so the NFT gets you into the carnival, and now you're experiencing that world. Um, and you might be hungry, you might want to ride Thrill Seeker, whatever it is, right? Well, in this game situation, it's like we probably need more tickets, some sort of token system that they would use to say like, hey, go buy, you know, 10 bucks gets you 53 tokens, and then, then you, you know, each ride or each thing has these different tokens amounts. So you go and do that. So there's some sort of currency inside the current carnival. I kind of think about that as, as the token of saying like, how do we drive utility? to not only make decisions on what we spend the money on to put inside this carnival, but what's also make it part of the, the currency that allows you to do the stuff inside of the carnival, right? The the concession stand might be like a hot dog guy and he's like, hey, it's $5 a hot dog. And he doesn't care about the carnival currency. He's a hot dog vendor and he wants his $5. And I think the same thing is like, hey, we might have merch or you know these experiences inside of our world that is, it's five bucks. Like it's $5 USDC, it has nothing to do with the token. You obviously you needed a, ticket to get in here, but it's, you know, a commemorative memorabilia, et cetera. The roller coaster is my favorite part, which is the roller coaster might require tokens and you meeting a requirement, right? So you might need to be four feet tall, something like that, you know, basically not, not children uh, able to, to ride on it. And what I think is so interesting about this in our analogy is like, that might be for us, like the actual equity position. You might have to be an actual credit investor or potentially even a qualified investor, depending on the different criteria. The MBA team we work with or the MBA bylaws that we're working with, they might say, hey, this needs to be all US, you know, Americans and Canadians. So, you know, sorry, the rest of the world. That, 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 that's what our lawyers are recommending us to do. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's the case, but you can imagine a, a degree. They might want a certain diversity uh, level of the LPs in the group. Like, 
any quite requirement they want to go do that's fine that's that's the sign on on the roller coaster and says like okay here's all the rules in order to get on this roller coaster um we might need to also sell another ticket just for the roller coaster and you meet the requirements right but that would be inside the carnival and so that's what i just that's how i kind of think about this world where it's like one is to get in another is to sort of to govern what is happening inside the space as well as to participate most of it and then because of SEC compliance and you know MBA bylaw compliance and all the kind of real world challenges, there might be a pretty long list uh, on the roller coaster that says you have to meet this exact criteria and the ticket might be expensive to ride that roller coaster as well. Can I have a follow-up question? Yeah. So this sounds very interesting. Now, when it comes to governance and, and having people owning this token and deciding on some potentially key decision for this club, how how do you guys plan to prevent, let's say, malicious uh, token owners from, let's say, competing teams that they want to drive this team as much to the ground as possible from owning these tokens and participating in the in the governance, basically, to whatever is the bad decision as they vote for it or bad proposals. Let's say bad and it's good for yeah. their other team or something. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so this exists in the real world, right? And so well, that's the nice thing about this problem is that all of these these problems that we can kind of come up in the edge case have all existed in uh, the traditional world. The reason that they feel extra challenging is because of the assumptions that we make about what Web3 is, right? So we might, you know, I'm obviously operating as a pseudonym behind a face filter as an example. One of the rules of this roller coaster might be, hey, you're KYC, you're signing this legal agreement, maybe you have a non-transferable token for maybe one year or something like that. Uh, you have to prove that you have no equity in any other position through your government identity, through your taxes, paperwork. Like, I'm not sure the depth that will be required on this, this rule list, but I would imagine it's gonna be quite extensive. Um, so as much as my crypto degen part of me wants to be like, this token is just like, buy the token, go wild, you get to make decisions when no one knows who anyone is. This might be the lamest crypto token from a from a like Web3 ethos perspective you've ever bought, right? Which is like non-transferable, you had to KYC yourself into it, uh, you had to validly send in tax documentation, sign a bunch of legal paperwork, like the least degen token you've ever seen in your life. But once we have that, which I think is so powerful, and I think this is the part that a lot of Web3 misses is like, well, holy shit, like we have a wallet now that has a token that can use this fundamental infrastructure and technology for us to go build all these experiences on top of it. And you might go to the stadium and it checks for that NFT or that token to be able to allow you to go do these things, digital experiences, metaverse experiences, whatever it is. So we can blend those two worlds together. And I think that's the part that like, I think Kraushaus is thinking about that's, that most people aren't, is that you have the socios and you know these different, uh, these different teams thinking about tokenized securities. And it's like, that's cool, but like, I want to blend those two worlds together. Uh, there's nothing stopping us from issuing two types of tokens, going back to the carnival. Here's like the actual boring security token. And then we mirror it with the fun Chuck E. Cheese token. And like, you can do both in these worlds. Like, I, I think that that's how we think about it. So to answer your question more, you know, explicit, it's like, it's probably a pretty vetted experience to even get on a quote unquote whitelist to even buy into this position that's going to have a lot of KYC signing paperwork and, and proving that you aren't, you know, colluding and, and have uh, competitive assets. Thank you a lot. Thanks a lot. One thing I just want to add on that is like, I think about ownership as being three things, access, equity, and governance uh, of, a, of an asset. And what I think is really powerful when you think about remixing those three ideas is that, and I like to use this house analogy, right? It's like, Okay, I own my home. What does that mean? It's like, well, I have access to it. I can walk into it. I can sleep at it at night. I can not sleep at it. I can do whatever I want with it in terms of access. Um, I have equity in it, which means that if the price goes up, the price goes down, I capture the difference in that in the capitalist world. The third is governance. I can repaint it. I can tear down a wall. I can update the kitchen, whatever. So I own this home, access, equity, and governance. I think in crypto, in this sort of Web3 space, it's like we can remix those. So we might say, hey, this collective, there might be 200 people in this 10,000 per people that are the only people that are financially and regulatorily available to own that equity slice of that. But because this is a cultural and entertainment asset, the fact that having access and governance over the asset is, is by definition a fun, enjoyable experience opens up a world of possibilities. Because like my house is an example, like, you know, what, it, what would like um, access would look like maybe Airbnb, right? So I'm sharing access to my home through for a financial reward through something like Airbnb. Um, 
a governance might be like like having someone like move in with you and you split the house 50 50 right there's kind of these these remix things that are kind of boring with a house but with a basketball team it's like well i like to tell you the story of like a 14 year old girl in india she's got the best basketball mind in the world there's no very small path for her to get into any influence in the nba right now she might be completely not able to own actual raw equity due to all the compliance and regulatory issues that the, M the MBA, the US, IRS, all this stuff. But there's nothing stopping through a delegated world to say if she continually delivers the best meritocratic results of MBA thought leadership, that we can't put her courtside, go to the practice, meet the players, like be heavily involved in this team, but potentially not own raw equity in it but earn incredible access and incredible governance to that team without the, the, without the equity. And so like, I think that that world, because it's a cultural entertainment asset, allows you to really do some cool stuff with that. Not all assets are gonna have that capability, but I think an NBA team is certainly one of them. That's it so far, um, if you wanted to continue. <laughs> You're on mute, sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm glad I touched on my access equity and governance uh, rant, because I do think that is like a really, really interesting space. Um, again, I think there's a lot of caveats that I'm trying to be intentional with. You know, Krauss House is a, is a you know, social DAO. Uh, it is interacting with, you know, this relatively high entertainment, high cultural asset, which gives us a lot of flexibility. I think if you're, you know, thinking about things, you know, more in the, um, you know, buying real estate and like th these types of things that are more uh, boring for lack of a better word. Sorry for anyone working in those spaces, but um, you lose like the things like access and governance lose their inherent value. Um, and so I just think that this, our particular project in this particular space just has a lot of degrees of freedom of that. And you see that with fans, um, the Green Bay Packers are a great example. And I don't want to go too far down the sports stuff with you guys, but they're owned by the fans allegedly. Uh, but in the 1940s, like, they went public and, and sold the, the taxpayers of Brown County in, in the Green Bay area basically bought the team as a collective. The team still sells shares to the team to this day. About every five to 10 years, they sell shares. Those shares are non-transferable. Uh, they have no equity. They have no dividends, no governance rights, no representation, nothing. They're a piece of paper that sends you own the piece of the, of the Green Bay Packers. These sales typically generate 10, 20 million dollars uh, every five years. Um, what is happening? Right. And it's like that's about identity. It's about supporting a cause. It's about, you know, this this tribe of, of Green Bay Packers. It's highly irrational, highly irrational. But because the asset's so compelling and so interesting, uh, they, they, they get one perk. They get to go to luncheon at Lambeau uh, in the summer. Uh, so it's an all paid lunch. Um, but I mean, normally a player or two comes up and says a couple of things. But that's it. Uh, it's a fancy, you know. Very expensive uh, lunch. I think assets that can drive that type of commitment to it, they have tremendous opportunities to remix this access governance and, and equity thing. Um, and so anyways, that's that's probably more about Krauss House than about governance. But um, I think that projects in that space just have a lot of uh, excitement and flexibility. Um, I don't think I think I covered most of my governance pieces that I wanted to touch on. I alluded to one thing, and I just think that you know you guys are our sharp group thinking about kind of compliance, governance, um, participation, things like that. It's just worth noting. I would encourage everyone to really explore these very. I feel like there's gonna be two buckets of capitalization uh, in the in the eco space or the you know the ecosystem. One is the very degen DeFi like raise on chain go do crazy things, crazy smart contracts, you know, party bids, like like that whole world. There's, I think there's a, you know, a constitution DAO, that whole thing. And then I think there's this other really, really interesting space, which is getting really, really educated on what are the current, like at least in the US, SEC compliant ways to raise a bunch of capital, um, do it fully compliant, and then take those, that, those pieces of equity and turn them into tokens and NFTs, and then do really cool experiences with them. And so Krauss House is kind of forced to, to live in between those two worlds. Uh, and so I get to just spend a lot of my time exploring uh, how we can raise you know, a shit ton of capital and then also make it toward a digitally native. And I think something that a lot of folks are not looking at is private equity. Um, and I think private equity has a really interesting structure because you have LPs 
That can be a certain group of people, which can be a quite a large group of people, depending on the amount of capital that you're raising. And then you have a GP, which is a general partner. So LPs, um, limited partner, GP is the general partner. General partner is typically a human being who's operating these things. Um, there's a case to be made that a GP could be a DAO. And I think once you unlock your thinking in that way, uh, it's still early to be determined the kind of legalities and kind of how that all work. But I think it's really fascinating to explore this idea of the general partner is actually decentralized collective making general partner type decisions. And then the beauty in this is that fees and carry, which is a traditional financial model for a private equity fund can push through to the GP, which is back to the DAO. Um, and if you really like digest that for a second, it's it's kind of fucking wild. Um, and it opens up an insane amount of degrees of freedom to go try to do a bunch of crazy stuff with with buying really interesting assets as well as doing it um, you know, fully compliant. So um, I just feel like I'd share that to, to this group given your guys' uh, sophistication in this space. Are there any other questions uh, for Commodore? Before I ask mine. Um, so I actually heard about your proposal process, um, which I thought was really interesting as well. I think that one of the biggest obstacles for many people are whether or not they should be submitting a proposal, whether or not it's like appropriate, whether or not um, they'll get any feedback that's actually helpful because this whole proposal thing is new to everybody. And what I've also seen is sometimes our forum is being treated like Twitter where everybody has like a crazy idea and they just like submit a proposal to, to do it or get a temp check, which kind of like busies the forum, right? And, and, and kind of decreases the engagement of proposals that require like large engagement and that also have a possibility of actually being implemented. So I kind of wanted to know a little bit about your proposal process strategy and also like how do you kind of keep focus on the proposals that like actually matter? I don't know if you have seasonal goals or things like that for, for the community to kind of guide themselves into the, that process. Yeah, we don't have seasonal goals currently. We did seasons for a while, we stopped them. Um, but we do have a phase of our roadmap, which is credibility. So everything is assessed through the lens of building credibility as, as, a, as an entity. So that is helpful having a North Star. So I, I certainly have found that to be advantageous. Um, as it relates to the proposals, like we've recently um, embraced Discord's forum feature that they have. Um, I have found that to be, I really disliked the, the going to discourse and, and doing all that and bringing it back in the Discord. And like, I, I found that. So I was very excited about Discord's forum feature. Um, I would say that we do a lot of, you know, temp check type, type stuff there as well as kind of gearing up for what a proposal may or may not be. Um, and then we host a weekly town hall and a stewards call, which is kind of making going through that validator process live with the community, as well as you know being able to have any conversations about it. Um, and I think that that forcing function of having a synchronous spot, as painful as it can be, and as discomfort as it can be, seems to at least work for us to really do a forcing function of like, okay, so someone posts a vibe check, or a, you know you made the Twitter comment of like it's just an idea. It's like it's going to be met with let's like, just say hey it's like a cool idea man you should flesh it out the next step for them is really just to like talk about it at a town hall or stewards call and that forcing function of having a synchronous time that the community is coming together and we try to alternate you know to be friendly with uh, all the time zones which is not easy but um it's doable you know if you keep alternating uh, enough um that i think that creates a little bit of social barrier there too which is like good which is say like hey that's a cool idea and you bring it to the, to the town hall and it's like some ideas just sit on their own, right? Just like, hey, we should do X, Y, and Z. And like, I don't need to explain it all. But um, some ideas just kind of take some massaging and talking through and and getting that. And so that's really worked for us. So that town hall then is often an area where ideas can kind of get fledged out, kind of, you know, take it to a little bit to the next level. And then any person who wants help from any steward to help turn that idea into a valid proposal, stewardship teams, basically, that's like the, the, their job, for lack of a better word, is like, yeah, like, let's let's turn this into a, a, a formal proposal for you. Um, there's some friction there. There's probably, I could imagine some cynics saying, well, there's kind of, you know, like, what if the proposal is to get rid of the stewards? Now you have a steward who's like assisting in the process of getting rid of themselves. And so there's certainly some some problems there. 
Um, but I think that between the synchronous call and kind of the dis, uh, Discord forum space, that would be enough of an energy, I think, to get over the hump on something like that. But um, that's been our general process and it seemingly worked pretty well. But again, I, you're going back to our biases in the beginning. Andrea, you had a question? Yeah, I want to follow up on, on that. Um, what exactly did you hate about the Discord to Discourse swap? And what is it that you like about having forums in Discord? Yeah, um, I hate Discord, uh, period. So there's. let me start with a bias that I don't say that's like, <laughs> like as a happy Discord user. Uh, I don't, I like the idea of discourse. Um, I don't like having our members move from one area to another. And then, you know, like if discourse had a dis login with discord that was like super native and intuitive, like, then maybe they have that, but, um, but like that to me would be a killer integration that I'd at least like be open-minded. I just hate this sort of like, you know, someone buys an NFT, they see you on Twitter, they buy an NFT and then they like go to this website and the website basically redirects them to a discord and they go to discord and then they got to connect to some nft validator and then they're in there and then someone's like i have a cool idea go click this link and then they click on that link and then they need to talk about it they got to go sign up for this discourse thing and then they sign up for that and then they vote you know sort of symbolically over there on different things and then we have to like go and check that thing and then be like okay that's good cool like now let's make that a snapshot thing now i gotta go to snapshot and i'm like you know it's just i think the more the less of those the better so as much as i hate discord I'm like, well, if we can get in there, we get vibe checks with reaction emojis, or we can get just people like there's one spot for them to check. It's hard enough getting them in the Discord to even kind of stay on top of that. And our one kind of external leap is back to snapshot, which I think certainly does the best because of like, hey, you you have your wallet, just connect. Like you don't have not, don't have to create a new account, all that stuff. That feels like the least friction way uh, of doing it, even though you lose a lot. Like and Discourse has plenty of great little features. Um, like email notifications as an example um that are you know but some people um i think i think there's a valid argument to say that that friction is actually good if you're not willing to go to discourse and not willing to sign up and not like then maybe you shouldn't be in their discourse and discussing it anyway so i, I think that's probably the most valid counter argument that i that i would like um but i just don't love taking the community and like having them get them all these different places and doing all these these different things we what, like one thing is like we're exploring not having Discord be our DAO home, which I feel like is a little sacrilegious. Um, and we we have the advantage like we're playing with this sports betting app as an example. I don't think it's going to be our home, but it's it, they basically clone Discord and it has sports betting all in integrated. What I love about that is that when you think about the raw entertainment value of our average user, it's like you come in, you see sports scores, you talk with you about your favorite teams, you pick predictions like. That to me might be the cultural drumbeat of something like Krauss And then all the DAO stuff and all of the mission, like that's sort of emergent for us. And like, it's again, clearly a, a unique use case compared to other DAOs, but I'm just really curious and exploring. Now you have you add in push notifications, right? Like that are not Discord in the army of Discord. It's now an independent object. Like, I don't know. I'm, I'm fascinated with that Krauss House's home might not be Discord or it is a conglomerate of you know, it's a Twitter, it's, a, you know, like it's, it's meet us where you're at. Like, I don't know, but Discord is continuing to frustrate me. That's an aside. Um, I think in regards to what you've just said is that it's not so much that people aren't like a tuner interested in governance and that's why they're not going to discourse. It's the fact that like, we don't get notifications that something is there for people to see. And so then we have to go through this external platform for for activities or things that impact the DAO that's in this other platform and you know and the same thing with like Twitter and and Google Meets you know and so ironically a centralized hub where people can do all of the things that they need to do um, I think is is something that I'm definitely also looking for a solution for as well um, so I I want to be conscious of time but um, if anybody else has any questions, burning questions for Commodore. Yeah, and for a record, I'm not bullish uh, that we'll find any solution on this. It just might be a byproduct of, um, I think something I rant a lot about is like, are DAOs just alumni networks? And if so, what does that mean? Uh, and just like an alumni network, it's like, yeah, I mean, 
you know, the fact you have a piece of paper that says you graduated from there or even attended there and that's on your LinkedIn, that's a form of, of you know, network. Um, uh, just verbally talking to someone, oh, I went to Stanford, oh, you went to Stanford, like that, that's a form of it. Um, and then all the way to like a Facebook group and a Telegram or a text message threads with your college friends, like those are all forms of what an alumni network sort of system of communication is. I, I think most of us, you know, if you're looking at worlds, like do they get most of their Stanford news from a, like an email blast from stanford.edu? Probably not. Um, and like, that's like a fascinating situation that I think DAOs can learn a lot from. Great, great ending. Thank you so much for your time, Commodore. I'm actually going to add um, the link to our Notion page, which also has the link to our Telegram group so that we can continue such conversations. Um, I shared your Twitter thread that actually sparked me to ask you to join this group as well. Um, and if you could just remind me of that podcast that you mentioned, I can also include that in the Telegram group as well. Yeah, I will. Let me just give it a quick Google. Yeah, there it is. Uh, sorry for this is the the Apple link. So, uh, but it exists elsewhere. Okay. Cool. Great. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, next week, Theo will be talking about um, safe DAOs governance um, and the delegated voting and the guardianship as well. So please join us next week. Have a good rest of your week, folks. See you in the Telegram. Thanks. Bye.